IPS Deep Think Tank. Okay, we are recording. It is 10-12-2024, Saturn Day, and this is episode two of the IPS Deep Think Tank. We talk about anything, everything, and then promote this to the regular channels as a podcast. And this will bring in, hopefully, more people, more ideas, and anything we gloss over, perhaps we can go into more detail. So thanks, everyone, for joining. And it's pretty much open floor. We've been talking about a lot of things. I think we firmly established the correlation between the fictional universe of Gotham, Batman, Joker, and everything going on with the Trump campaign. Like, that is beyond dispute. We're way past being mystified and blown away by it, as synchro mystics seem to be. We have figured out this is part of the entrainment process for future fake news that becomes fake history, because the conquerors who conquered us uh, write our history. I think we've made a lot of progress um, in the last few months, uh, largely in part thanks to the rapid succession of psyops that continually validate our model. So I think we're doing very well as a think tank, and I think it's important that we continue to gather as a think tank like we used to in Discord. So that's why I decided to um, start this new podcast series. And I think that it'll also attract more people who hear it on the replay. So with the Trump thing, do you think that they're just putting it in our face that the whole presidential thing is just a comic strip? Um, That is interesting. Um, I would say I think the reason why they hit that is that they want to reach the most number of people. So adults watch Man in Full with Charlie Coker. They see Trump. The Batman targets the youth. I think it targets a wider audience. So I think it's just part of the fact that they need the messaging to be ubiquitous. It needs to be in everything. And that's and, and the Joker Batman thing, I think it has some strong political significance with the Joker versus Batman dialectic that correlates with left versus right, Antifa versus God Boy. So I think the Batman universe is being exploited by the uh, propagandists. But you do get, you make a good point here, because Trump does bring things down to the level of world wrestling entertainment and comics. Like it really does trivialize yeah, that's, it. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That's what I was. That's what I was speaking to, <laughs> because he does. He, he he's a he's a comedian within himself. I mean, all of his speeches and that kind of thing. So it just makes you. It's almost like he takes on the Joker role. Um, and he knows it. He knows he's taken on that role. It, it's weird. Have you seen Joker Part 2? No, but I've heard people talk about it. But Okay, because um, this, is, this is interesting, because I was looking at, you know, for the most part, Batman is associated with Trump. However, in this Joker 2, it's about him in the Joker role, and they're trying to convict him of being, you know, this, this this mastermind, this criminal killer. But his argument is that he's not the Joker. It was just a role or it's a split personality. But the whole thing was about roles. And that's the exact courthouse where Trump was. So there's, there is kind of a, a Trump-Joker um, overlap here. And I think you nailed it there. And it's certainly the case that they want to drag this halfway into fiction. It's more malleable, I think. Well, I also think there's an aspect to it that Trump is Batman and the Joker because it's like shadow characters of of who Trump really is, which nobody knows, right? Because he doesn't portray that to the world. I mean, we have no idea who he really is, so, yeah. Well, in the Cape Crusader series on Amazon, the last episode, Batman throws the boomerang at Rupert Thorne and cuts his ear as a warning, I'll be back at season two. 
Season 2 is picked up by Amazon on August 4th, which is a hugely significant date. But the other part of it is that the character's name, Rupert Thorne, seems to tie into Damien Thorne, who's another Trump character. So yeah, Trump is represented in many different ways, whether it's like a, a real estate magnate, a politician, a xenophobic, or a kind of a, a demagogue, a bad mafia don. So he has all these aspects. A con man, that's a big one. And in that 1958 show, Trackdown, the con man named Trump ends up getting arrested at the end. And people noticed that was Trump predicted programming in 2015, 2016 way before he got arrested. So having rewatched it, I'm like, that was even more prescient than it was eight years ago, which is kind of fascinating to watch how it unfolds. Yeah, on the Batman role, because Trump's out there saying right now that if he gets elected, he's going to um, fix the immigrant problem, right? So that's a Batman, that's a Batman character aspect. Save the world. In QAnon lore, he's a savior and he's a hero. But he has a, a different aspect to the other side. So you're kind of right about that. How they're, they're, they're basically, it's like, like, if you're on one side, you see one person. On the other side, you see another. Same with Bill Gates and Elon Musk. A lot of these billionaires have these two aspects depending on where you are. Savior destroyers. You know, Musk is a destroyer. Yeah. He's also our yeah. savior. Yeah. But yeah. Savior destroyers. How does that even happen? I think they're they're just the archetypal um, personification. Because archetypes usually have both sides, per se. A good and evil side. And we have to recall, I mean, this is fundamentally literature. We're looking at history in the making. It's a story. So these characters have depth, and that would make sense. Many, many layers. You know, Trump has the Christ archetypes, the Christ typology attached to him in addition to everything else. And I'm like, wait, how is this guy so much anti-Christ, but at the same time, he's being compared with Christ? How can you be both? So there, there's definitely um, a heavy element here to the superimposition of archetypes and characters in order to like enrich that character and, and amplify their messaging. So Trump is definitely a composite, right. just as much as Musk is. Yeah, and the evil side was warp speed in 2020, right? Because he, I mean, look what that turned into. I mean, and all the propaganda from the right, which is who's supporting Trump right now, but yet they're against, they're, they're so anti-vax. It, it's crazy how they set that up. Only right-wingers and, and conspiracy theorists see that as evil. Everyone else sees that as good. It's kind of important to keep you know in mind that like yeah half the country is in favor of all the worst stuff at any given moment. It's ridiculous. So you think that like we're, we can all agree that this is bad, right? And the, the other half's like no, nah, and you should go to jail for not agreeing with me. It's insane. It's because the population is comprised of programmers who are just programmed to be programmers, and as I think David Ike said, we are our own prison wardens. And that's certainly true. I'm waiting for the helmet, Karens. You know, where's your helmet? Space junk is real. We could start that as a movement. We just walk around with a helmet on and, and even just, I don't know, maybe you have like a, some writing on the side of it, like ask me about space junk. Because if you're not wearing a helmet for space junk, can you legitimately claim that you believe in this stuff? Like, where are the true believers, you know, walking the walk? We're supposed to believe this ridiculous stuff, and it doesn't seem like they take it that seriously. Yeah, I've yet 
to see anyone protect themselves against chemtrails, even though I hear about it all the time. I've yet to see one. There are a lot of people making bold claims about how the hurricane was caused by chemtrails, and that's horrifying. Like If that were true, if the power elite had that ability to create these massive storms and just destroy places, uh, why wouldn't they just own it? Why wouldn't they just come out and just show it? You know, like, hey, look, Neil, we control the weather. We would have no choice. But no, uh, weather modification theories is how the right wingers are trained to respond to fake climate news. So, climate change, geoengineering, weather modification, anybody who claims that the weather is worse than it ever was is programmed. It's a big lie. I did um, watch this short clip of a video. Um, I, I don't know who posted it. But I think it was on another server, but um, he was saying that those cloud sea machines or whatever that they have on the ground was what NASA uses for the liftoffs, which makes sense to me that they would use that. <laughs> it kind of creates the same effect. I'm wondering if they're past the days of putting fireworks in the bottom of cylindrical blimps, if they're just going full-on CGI now. And in recent weeks, Musk has said on multiple occasions that, yeah, these videos from space look like CGI. He's admitted that. That's a big deal. But it, it was a, a power move. It was like they're taking that from us. So now millions of skeptics can say, hey, this looks like CGI. And he can get in front of it and say, yeah, it does. But it's real. So he took that talking point away from us somehow. I don't quite understand the mechanism. It's like a flat out um, agreement slash doubling down on the lie. I guess you call that gaslighting. What are you going to believe, your lying eyes or what I tell you? So yeah, Musk is a gaslighter, top tier programmer and gaslighter. Had someone messaged me today saying that they're looking at a lot of these channels that a lot of channels that have already been there for a long time suddenly jumped on this hurricane story. And he says a lot of these channels are getting their numbers seemingly just pumped up abnormally. Like these are like plants. Sort of like all those massive Q channels. If you remember, if you used to put in your hashtags, stuff like the awakening or where we go one, we go all. You could blow up. I had a Twitter channel with 5,000 followers because I was pretending to be QAnon. And I was selling the PDF of all the Q drops on Teespring for five bucks. I made like $200 selling Q drops and honors. Like that's, how, that's how popular the thing had become at one point. But um, this is like astroturfing, what, like they do in politics. It's a lot of fake people invented in advance ready to act when the big psyop happens. Uh, it, it's pretty much disaster capitalism. It's, it's definitely a mount, there's a, an element here, I think, of some people just taking advantage of a situation, but there's also just swarms of actors. And they all look like actors to me. They don't look like normal people. They, they look like they're uh, thespians. They have headshots. They're going to acting agencies and getting roles as extras. They look like extras to me. What do you think? Have you, any of you have seen, have any of you looked at these anti-FEMA actors on Twitter or, or, or on TikTok seemingly upset about second and third hat accounts of how bad things are? Because they all look like actors to me. I've seen a few of those videos, but it, I, I'm not on TikTok or Twitter. I see them from other people. But yeah, they, they look, I mean... It, if that was actually going on, wouldn't you have more emotion involved in it? it? It's it's just weird. 
It doesn't look anything like real life. Do you agree that they're pushing the Civil War narrative now? Um, I have a hearsay. Uh, can you guys hear me? I, I haven't tested this microphone. This is a new account. We can hear you. Let's okay. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. My uncle lives in Florida, and he said that he, I mean, like I said, it's hearsay, but he said there's like um, 120 mile an hour winds and it like rained really hard for like eight hours. But, um, no, no he, he survived and no significant property damage for him the people along the coastline apparently ha had a, a harder time with the damage to their houses well, i believe it i mean i i do believe that there is a storm possibly a hurricane the category they say but i think the discrepancy lies in what they show us from the satellite imagery what they report, and what the actors on the ground are saying. Sort of like the Twin Towers were demolished. But was it a terror attack, and were there thousands of casualties? Was it caused by planes? And that, like, that's all the media augmentation. Basically, we're looking at a regular run-of-the-mill event, and they add a bunch of stuff onto it. And so that's kind of what I see here at these hurricanes, is that when there's a natural disaster... You have people who are able to just add on to it in the chaos. I I wonder about the intention of these people, or like how many are independent actors, or are there people actually being funded by a greater organization to like collectively fraud this event? We used to find on websites like Craigslist, there'd be listings for actors needed for a mass casualty event in a big city. And these would generally happen right before a, quote, real event. And it seems like now the business of crisis acting is largely decentralized, like you're a remote crisis actor. So it could be that these individuals are responding to an ad. And we need you to read this monologue. But the... The question of, you know, are these people all feds? Are they agents? Are they signing NDAs? Yeah, there has to be some quality control and some kind of secrecy built into it. But I know from experience, from posting ads as a joke, just to test the waters, there are many out-of-work actors out there, and they will take any amount of money and do anything. You'll, we had so many ads, so many responses. Hundreds of people saying, yeah, I'll... I'll claim I witnessed a mass murder on TV. I'll lie to the news for 50 bucks. So I'm just thinking that a lot of these are just actors getting hired remotely. It'd be worthwhile to track them down one by one. Some of them you can just tell. Like this one's like, I'm a volunteer nurse. And I heard from somebody's friend who saw something on TikTok that this bad thing happened. And after I hyperventilate for 10 minutes, I'm going to be able to talk about it. And then they put, one of them was like, fake crying after six minutes over stuff that she didn't see. And then she says, here's the GoFundMe link. And don't worry, I have a spreadsheet. I will get the wire information from fire departments and I will make sure the money goes where it needs to go. Because I have a spreadsheet. I'm supposed to look at this person who's not even a good crisis actress and send her some money her go fraud me account assuming it's going to help some victims out there that i don't even know aren't being served by fema so this is a huge psyop it's also a setup it's a setup to make it look like the right wingers are so anti-government they're a danger to the government and I, I could see this leading to something i think they might be setting up another waco and i think there's a lot of foreshadowing for it for example trump kicking off his campaign in waco trump in court on the anniversary of waco some guy sets himself on fire outside, just like Dave Koresh was set on fire at Waco. So I think we're being set up for some kind of like 
right wing psyop similar to Waco, anti FEMA. They're building it up. So I think a lot of this is not just for grift and for money, but I think a lot of it is setting up some kind of right wing anti government extravaganza. Like, it shouldn't be the case that every single eyewitness could be readily identified as having right-leaning politics. You would have libs out here. You would have people on all sides of the spectrum, recommend, uh, or non-politicals even. I'm just here, and it's terrible, but FEMA's helping us. Like, no, we don't see the pro-FEMA videos. We just see the anti-FEMA videos. And it makes me wonder, it's like, there's a, such a... A discrepancy here. I, I think that we can just rule out anything that's not showing us firsthand evidence at this point. We just can't trust it. Show me the bodies entombed in cars. You can get it on the internet, put it on Telegram, let us see it, and then we'll be more inclined to donate money. I'll be more inclined to help out if I see it, but all we're getting are second and third hand accounts. But beyond being annoying, they're creating this narrative that's being bounced off of where major major news stories are coming out saying that geoengineering conspiracy theorists are calling meteorologists and threatening their lives. If you remember, they said anti-vaxxers were threatening nurses at COVID stations. Now they're saying anti-geoengineering types are threatening scientists and meteorologists. I had someone send me a message and they said that we need to find out or do an examination of all of the writers and producers behind any kind of Batman or Joker associated cartoon or comic that predicts the Trump thing and look at all the movies that predict the Trump thing and then, you know, do a Venn diagram. And this Venn diagram should show us you know, who's closer to the top of the capstone, who's in the know with regard to this entire Trump situation, which is still unfolding. I think that'd be worthwhile. And I'm also interested in, it's kind of obvious to me, like I look at these TikTok crisis actors, they're no-name people, and they're put on blast by well-established influencers. So there's a strategy here. They use alt media influencers to prop up crisis actors or right-wing psyops. Although, like on the on the news, you have CNN, NBC, mainstream news. They show you the crisis actors. And they sell the story, but to sell the right wing version of psyops, they rely heavily on their influencers. It's a mirror of the mainstream. Just got to point it out. It's a it's a common misconception that crisis acting is like a left wing thing to grab your guns, and it's like no, it's everywhere. Well, we talked years ago about them bringing the right and the left together eventually, and I don't think either side sees how close they are to the other side. They, they're oblivious to it. They, they, <laughs> they think their side's better, which is crazy because both sides almost look the same these days. And another thing, too, is both sides do psyops that benefit their narrative and, and say something against the other side. So they, they, they're both in on the PSYOP entertainment complex. And that's a very important point because some will say, well, like on the left, they're saying Trump faked his ear thing, and they can't really go all the way with that line of thinking. And the fact that he faked it would imply that the left and right media are both part of it because they don't blow the whistle on each other. Like you never see... Right-wing media saying, hey, the libs are faking mass shootings to grab your guns. Alex Jones used to say that, but he pulled back. But they don't call out the other side's psyops. They just bounce off of the event as though it's real. So you have to recognize that the psychological operations are done from the top down. 
and they're so they're performed or they're written and executed at such a high level that it's above the party distinction. That party distinction is there to maintain the info war, to maintain this tug of war. That's the only reason they have it, and that's why it will never be reconciled. They will look like each other at the fringes. The political horseshoe model explains this. It will resemble each other, but they'll never quite touch. So it's not a full circle, it's a horseshoe. So you don't think eventually they'll bring the two together to create the one world government type of thing? Sort of, no, because the, sort of. the one world government is bifurcated by design. So if you're, you're not going you're not going to have a merger of toxic masculinity and feminism. You're not going to have a merger of anti-gun and pro-gun or anti-needle and pro-needle, anti-immigrant, pro-immigrant. Their attitudes on everything are diametrically opposed, so they never join. Because it's that polarity that keeps this machine moving. And this is intrinsic to their all of their operations. It's always about the split. And the fact that the political horseshoe um, brings them so close together um, just, to me, illustrates more than anything that this is the design. you got proud boys versus soy boys. No, they're never going to agree. But at the same time, they're fighting over the middle. They're trying to convert the middle to their side. And that is the nature of the perpetual war that George Orwell spoke of. That if they got together and became friends, there wouldn't be war. And war is peace, like Orwell wrote. And it literally is. The mind war amounts to physical peace. Like we are existing in a state of more or less peace because everything's going on in our heads and in the simulation. Well, I mean, that's what it looks like now. But in the future, when all these kids grow up that have been exposed to the trauma in school of drills that don't want guns anymore, what's that world going to look like when it comes to politics? That, that's where I was kind of looking at. Yeah, I often wonder if maybe they're setting it up to destroy nationalism and destroy the right-wing ideologies and replace it with one world liberalism, which I think might be the agenda eventually. That might be it. So it's not that they're going to merge, yeah. but they're going to get yeah. rid of one half. It might be the case because alien invasion predictive programming is so pervasive, and it's all about the one world, dissolution of borders. And what's the barrier to that? Well, for the longest time, Alex Jones has said, and American patriots are a firewall against global tyranny. That's the narrative. So they're setting up that right. so that they right. can tear that down. I think you might be onto something yeah. in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I can speak from personal experience um, in this particular category, and I do have some thoughts on the matter as far as the future of. Uh, and the politics of, in particular, in America and firearms ownership. Um, for example, I I went um, to a, a bullseye shooting competition today. It was the last one of the season. But anyway, um, the point is, I'm almost always the youngest person there. Um, I go with my dad, and he's like, um, he he was in the army, so he was on the army shooting team, and, and now he's retired, but. You know, so we go bullseye shooting together, but there, there's not like young people that do very much. It's, well, to be fair, you know, bullseye shooting isn't like action, fast John Wick stuff, which might attract more young people. But still, demographically, most of the shooting people are older generations, and, and younger people are not as keen to pick up on that. But I'll transition to this to my other point and then let you guys have the floor. Um, I think that what people consider a weapon um, will change over time. So, like, in the past, firearms weren't regulated because the technology wasn't as advanced. And even nowadays, um, as you see these new regulations that affect drones, um, will be some type of examples of the types of weapons regulations in the future, which won't focus on firearms, but other advanced technologies, which are only in their infancy now. Um, and 
I don't know. But yeah, it is a psyop. You have a very good point every time you say, what good are your guns if you are mind controlled? It's it's pointless having all your guns and skills if, if your mind is, you know, controlled by someone else. Uh, that's all. Great points. Yeah, imagine. Imagine if you and a group of your friends, let's just say your patriots, your proud boys, your three percenter magas, so you gather up your friends, you get your AR-15s, you get your maga hats, and you drive into the tunnel to fight the deep state and the reptoids and the blood drinking uh, rituals. You're going to interrupt those. You're going to stop the vampires because Roseanne Barr told you that they're literal vampires and they eat babies. So you go down to save them, and you don't find anything. Or you amass an army of people with guns and you're ready to fight the New World Order or the Deep State Cabal. And once you're gathered, then what? When it turns out that the thing that you're gathered for doesn't exist. It would be like getting all your friends to move into bunkers. Like, hey, let's go move into a big bunker because we're going to get nuked. And you do it and then it turns out that nukes don't exist. So until you take control of your mind... The least thing you need to be worried about is them taking the guns. Because the, it's like the uh, like a big asylum at this point. Any kind of uprising is going to be like a bunch of uh, mental patients rising up against the orderlies. You're not going to get out, and you're not going to take over the mental hospital. I've made this point, too, with some of the more agile some of the more like aggressively agitated, angry truthers, I've made this point too. I said, I am not interested in activism with brainwashed people. What good is it to build up an army of the brainwashed? It's pointless. You're better off becoming a conscientious objector and stepping out of the Siwar entirely and then making your move, deciding if there is anything to do. And at this point, I advocate inactivism and I don't trust activists. If somebody has an agenda, I am very skeptical of it. And we've, we've encountered a lot of people who don't even know they have an agenda because they've been turned into propaganda mules. So some agent put a bunch of propaganda on your back, like a mule, and you're going to go run and spread it around, and you're not going to get paid for it because you're chasing a carrot. And I've seen that happen to a lot of people. I've seen that happen to a lot of truthers in general where they become unwitting carriers of mind viruses. They are the terrorists. Like, we could argue the mainstream media is a terrorist when it convinces you that radical Islamic terrorism exists and they're going to blow up malls in your neighborhood. But they scare you with that stuff. Now you live in a state of fear because you trust that authority. Therefore, you can call the news media a terrorist organization if the terrorists don't exist it's just a mind virus they plant in your head. Similarly, truthers are terrorists if they're filling people up with fears about things that don't exist. Because now they're changing somebody's worldview, adding some negative elements that might actually alarm them, put them in a state of anxiety and fear. And then who's the good guy in this? The truther? I would say no. They're a propaganda mule unwittingly spreading malinformation. I feel like that's one of the greatest benefits of this philosophy. Um, and usually here we uh, apply it to um, mainstream media and, and focusing on like fakery and media fakery. But um, this applied skepticism and, and realizing how important it is to examine our motivations before acting. Like if you're going to act some, make some decision that's affecting your life, how you spend your time, your your mental, physical, and and while well, spiritual, whatever energy you know, we have so much time and day. We have so much energy too, and, and we oftentimes don't appreciate our energy and our ability to focus it because our minds are 
you know, we are all dupable. We are all programmed. And and we can we we deprogram kind of one piece at a time, and, and it's an ongoing process. You know the whole, I mean, forty eight hours of news in one day. You know, I mean, but even in the broader sense, the amount of stimulation and information we process every day, and our interactions, is a lot, and and almost all of it's registered subconsciously. We don't have time to like process it all. But it's still like there, sitting around unresolved. And the more extreme, you know, emotional or, or motivational attachments that we have and internalize and refuse to examine, they're going to affect our behavior. And being able to like have that pause and to be like, am I am I acting on sound information or am I acting on hearsay or appeals to authority? to analyze the, the motivations and remove logical fallacies allows our energy to be made usable. So rather than flailing around in a proverbial hamster wheel of someone else's creation, you know, that's designed to keep us, you know, it, I mean, I I think there's a lot of questions about the status quo, whether the, the capstone people are good or evil and all this stuff, but suffice to say they obviously set people up with these hamster wheels. And if you believe, if you're an auto believer, if you're a mainstream media plus type, you know, you're going to be in the hamster wheel. You're not living your life. You're, you're in somebody else's, you know, virtual reality game. And, and you know, just we're very lucky to be able to take one foot off of the hamster wheel for a moment and most people don't don't do that very much you know yeah i'm looking back and i i cannot think of the last time that a a psyop fooled me where i was like reacting to it and then later found out i was wrong and that it was fake um, I, I've I've applied the fake until proven real approach for some time, and it has not failed me. But also, I'm recognizing when I am where I am dupable, and as studied as I am on these matters, I watched an episode of The Penguin before I recognized that I was looking at a mask. I didn't know that was Colin Farrell. So um, even I, you know, just even being wary of these things. These tricks bypass like an optical illusion. Uh, they bypass your awareness. So you have to be at least aware that trickery is being used and we are susceptible to it. And normies, especially space believers, they don't have that. They don't think of trickery as being in the realm of possibility. They don't think of special effects as being relevant to the conversation of news. They don't even think of propaganda as something that could be so sophisticated they don't even notice it and it's a sort of conceit and arrogance and ego in many ways that keeps the normies or anybody in their box from looking outside of their box and until you can admit that yeah i'm dupable i can be tricked then you are a mark at this point you you are um, right where they want you they want you to be overconfident in your quote perceptions because you think you're thinking for yourself but what what does it matter if you think for yourself if you're not perceiving for yourself? So yeah, I think for myself, but I outsource my perception with regard to these issues, to these corporate news agencies, trusting that they're not all secretly controlled by global government. Like, that's, that's ridiculous. That is not critical thinking. Uh, that is not thinking for oneself. That is outsourcing a sizable chunk of thinking to known pathological liars. It's naive at, at this point. Yeah, as far as the NASA fanboys go, not only that, they they scoff at the fact that that about the uh, the ability to fool. They don't even they just disregard it totally, as if it doesn't, as if it could never possibly exist. Because they love their ignorance that much. It's the emperor's new clothes. You know, where they're all in on it, 
on some level, and they don't want to appear to be unsophisticated. They just are, buy into the constant drum of anti-conspiracy theory propaganda where it's like, if you don't believe the screen, there's something wrong with you. And that, to me, is principally gaslighting. But, yeah, it's it's pretty bad. The people who are truly faithful adherents in this thing believe all the space stuff because they see it on the screen. Uh, they're making a, an error in looking at the screen as, quote, scientific evidence. No, video isn't evidence. It wouldn't pass in court. There has to be context. You have to know who filmed it. And a lot of the times, what people think is video from space in particular is a camera view within a simulated environment. It's not a physical camera. And there are tells. But these arrogant glurfs will, will rather, they'd rather mock you asking questions and they get into ad hominem instead of looking at it critically. We had like a week long debate with someone on Twitter about this bulging forehead vein on an upside down astronaut where he's like, that's not a bulging forehead vein. And so we debate and debate. And eventually he, he felt like he won on that point. And so then I move on to the next point. What happened to his cheekbones? This astronaut had well-defined cheekbones and sunken cheeks. His skin was kind of pale and a little, a little splotchy in places. It wasn't perfect. But then in the next shot, when he's upside down, his face is swollen like a tomato. His eyes are nearly closed. And I said he looked more like Kim Jong-il. Like how did he make that switch? And the only explanation is literally gravity, upside down, blood rushing to his head. And this guy refused to see it and instead spent his time launching personal attacks at me, which uh, at this point I'm immune to it. But that's the best they can do. So I have a similar about 311 in the shutdown. Uh, so the night before the actual shutdown in San Francisco, I was like, I've had it. I'm going to go public. I don't care how many friends I lose on Facebook or real friends. I mean, of course, I wasn't expecting that, but it certainly happened. But uh, first day I said, OK, here's what I'm going to try to demonstrate to everybody as far as what I had learned about media fakery uh, by the time March 11th, 2020 came around the night before, actually. And uh, I had made a suggestion to everybody. I said, do you personally, are you feeling the effects of, you know, the reason for the shutdown? I'll try to keep it sensor friendly here. And, uh, and or anyone you personally know, and have you witnessed it as someone you actually have in your life that you can vouch for their claims. Now, just by simply suggesting that I was questioning the media, whether left or right, at this point, it was all just you know, this terror that nobody had really bifurcated it totally at that point with the Trump scenario and everything that followed uh, between the two and the warp speed and all of that. Now, it, it took two weeks for anybody to actually suggest they knew anybody who was feeling the effects of anything broadcast by the media. Now, in between those two weeks, I probably had, and I should go back to the thread and actually count it, but I'm pretty sure it's close to about 100 uh, or 200 messages of people lambasting me because I was questioning the media. That was the real sickness, of course, the mental virus that everybody was being uh, affected by. But yeah, even then, after two weeks, it was like a sneeze and a cold. So it was really fascinating and, and somewhat depressing to see that people were so emotionally upset over me disbelieving their TV religious gods. It, it certainly took on the characteristics of a religion quite early on. Where it, it really did become a way for the government-controlled media, for the state, to be the savior. Their priests, their injectable Eucharist, they're the savior. And the people who reject the church doctrines, that is, those who reject mass media, then become the heretics, the non-believers, and the sinners those who are refusing to be saved. So it did become a salvation scenario. And that's when I realized this is really nothing more than the introduction of the concept of sin to a scientific audience. So they got the God construct of Gaia, 
to the godless atheists. They brought the modern concept of heaven, which is outer space, to the same. And in order to get them to believe in sin and regulate, they introduced this new element. And isn't it notable, too, that how the political left, who are largely aligned with scientism, don't believe in sin? You could not get them to, um, to cease their wicked behavior and sinful behavior because they don't believe in it. They mock the people who have traditional moral values. But the instant they introduced this new iteration of sin, the V, what happened? Overnight, the lefties became Puritans. Overnight, they had a Puritanical revolution. And yet the right wing, they didn't want to be Puritans about this. They didn't see these new, they don't recognize the left's concept of sin. So it's really just an archaic religious construct introduced to the masses. So it's 100% accurate to call it a sin. And when you were speaking, you were blaspheming. So you were leading them into heresy. You were like an atheist to a religious cult. So they probably got triggered on those grounds. Absolutely. And you could see it within their communication. You mentioned this previously as well, but it was all emotional. There was no science behind anything or no try to trying to be factually based in their communication. And people, it was fascinating on so many levels, but generally speaking, yeah, I was the heretic and uh, heretic and the nature of um, people uh, getting riled up was solely about being poked from their deep sleep. Uh, they needed to protect their nightmare and they did it with uh, vociferous communication. It was, it was shocking, but expected as well, because I, you know, I had never really tried to communicate on mass with many of my friends because I'm aware <laughs> that it wouldn't go very well. And, you know, I predicted the reaction, but indeed, just uh, by uh, lending some doubt to their, um, I don't know, for lack of a better phrase, their, their biblical reading of, of the media um, was enough to create just extreme emotional reaction. And that was the key. There was no logic. There was no reason. There was no thought trading. I mean, this forum here is a great example of just throwing ideas at each other. And for the most part, I've rarely heard people, you know, maybe Lynn getting a little bit off center when uh, some things uh, got into her nerves a bit, which I respect, of course. But, you know, and I'm not calling anybody out particularly. It happens. It'll happen to me, I'm sure. But uh, at the same time, this is a great forum for having exploration be the key. And if anybody was thinking with their reasonable mind, uh, then they could have figured this thing all out on their own. They wouldn't have needed any consultation with anyone. It would have just been a matter of everybody, let's put our facts on the table and let's make the best sense out of it. But by simply throwing out the question mark, it was enough to bring pitchforks and you know, fire branding torches to try to burn down anything that I was curious about. It was, it was, I was treated basically like a child <laughs> who was crazy. And actually, uh, a side note, because the thought of insanity came up, I actually had a friend who suggested in a public forum that I should be committed. <laughs> so that, that, those are the friends I have. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Back to, back to. Tim, I'd like to go back to what uh, Hummingbird was saying about skepticism and um, the lack, like not acting um, in their in their um, mouse wheels. Okay, so there's something called epochy, which is like just suspending judgment or just living in suspended skepticism of what you're seeing, what they're telling you. And that can make you not act. And then there's, well, if I just dig a little more, I will find the truth. Like you can just keep searching to try to solve your skepticism you know, it's like, well, if I had this much more information, I would know how to act. You know, and I have definitely fallen into that category, and probably everyone here has. It's not that you're, uh, you don't really want to act, but that you, you know, you're just, you need a little bit more information. You don't want to be duped again. And then uh, as a uh, 
foil to that to just try to act in creativity like within your own real space therefore you don't have to have the answers to all these things to live an active life um you know cuz the societal uh, approved actions are not really they don't make sense anymore like I live in an area when COVID hit and everybody locked down, all the lady friends of mine were all were all getting together in sewing circles to make homemade masks. And it was exactly like 9-11, which I fell for. I was I had young children then and we would have little craft time with the kids and make American flags. And I was I was the leader of that. You know, I was like, every kid's going to go home with their homemade American flag pin. But the when this happened again around here and it was homemade masks, we, you know, with the cute fabrics and all that crap, I was like, here we go again. So anyway, um, I just was going to throw that out there. You don't have to have all the answers to live a creative life and uh, see what everybody thinks about that. Oh, well, great points as far as epoche and suspension of judgment. If we don't have enough information, we suspend judgment, but we have to keep searching. There has to be some kind of good faith effort to find out the truth. I'm totally against just asking questions. I'm all for asking questions and seeking answers. But, um, and as far as that, the mask and the flag thing, isn't that interesting? I, I think I've, I've noted that before, where it seemed like after 9-11, American flags were everywhere. If you weren't waving an American flag, you were with the terrorists. And the mask, in a way, became the same virtue signal. I'm I'm uh, against the terrorists. I'm against the the thing which is the terrorist or the super spreaders. So the mask and the flag bumper sticker are visible ways of signing or signaling your allegiance, your complicity in your side in the in the mind war. And not wearing a mask or not waving a flag sent a completely opposite signal. So they do like to give us props. And they do like to involve us in their psy wars. And it's hard to be a non-participant because if you're not participating, you're automatically on the bad side. Like, I'm not participating, so I'm with the terrorists. I'm not participating, so I'm an asymptomatic super spreader misinformationist. They don't give you an opt-out. That was funny, Echo Charlie, what what you said about the <laughs> the masks. The Star Spangled Banner, right, was prominent you know, on 9 11. And it starts out with, Oh, say, can you see? And everybody was covered up with a mask in 2020, so they couldn't s- say anything technically. It was muffled. So <laughs> that's pretty funny. I never made that connection before, but yeah. Yeah, I think you could correlate the symbol of the mask with the covering of the mouth, with the censorship of speech. And they even said, speaking loud, singing, they, they made these direct correlations. But the idea is that mind oh, viruses come yeah, yeah, yeah. out of your yeah. mouth. That's a very powerful symbolism. Yeah, and another well-timed aspect of the PSYOP, which I, I couldn't believe people couldn't see it right in front of their faces, but the the calling cry or what have you, the uh, kind of underlying statement of GF, George Floyd PSYOP was, uh, I can't breathe. Well, have what what's on your face? <laughs> what's causing you not to breathe right now? And the synonymousness or the, the synergy of those two things, I think, was very powerful and, of course, on purpose. Yeah, absolutely. And remember, I can't breathe is an anagram for a better China, which ties in smoothly with BLM, the left Marxist class warfare, and BLM being the vanguard of a Marxist revolution. 
and I can't breathe can be applied to Gaia. Who can't breathe because capitalism has polluted her atmospheres with too much carbon. So yes, I can't breathe is like a zeitgeist slogan. They've attached it to the zeitgeist. We can't breathe. Humanity can't breathe. There was a Roland Emmerich film, Moonfall. He's the guy that did Independence Day that prepared us for 9-11. Well, Moonfall has a lot of space junk falling from the sky. And there's a scene where as the moon starts falling, the atmosphere is breaking apart. And there's this young, and this is all, I think, symbolism. A young immigrant girl says, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. So then an older male takes off his mask and gives it to her so she can breathe. So he sacrifices his life for her because the atmosphere is, is, is um, dissipating. But I see a lot of this stuff in movies and, and as we talk about often, but this is like coded messaging here. The whole asphyxiation thing, the West or the oppressors kneeling on the neck of the poor. Like they've told us this story in so many ways and that's definitely one of the main zeitgeist messages. Another layer to that is the, the majority of the masks in 2020 came from China, which is why they wear masks over there because they are industrialized and they got all the American manufacturing jobs, basically, and they pollute. So that's why they wear, wear the mask. So, I mean, how ironic, right? They spread it through the mechanism of like fashion trends. They use fashion. And, you know, the way fashion works is you have a unfashionable haircut and you're the only one, you kind of stand out. And peer pressure, not through what they say, but maybe ostracism or sideways glances, angry stares or mocking stares. There are various ways that uh, the mind, group mind, coerces the individual into joining and so they use fashion as a mechanism for spreading uniformity of thought and fashion is about uniforms and so it's kind of an interesting connection here between i think uh, fashion and fascism and that's kind of what we saw it was a i called it a fascist statement at that point because it means i'm in line with big government i'm against the private sector i don't think we should question government sponsored media so that's what the that's what the messaging was, and it was peer pressure. And I often you know point out how the programmers rely on the programmed to program each other, and this is one example of how they enforce it. Yeah, the entire population of the world carried twenty twenty. I mean, I saw it. Here in my little town I live in, it's like even the cops here came out and said they weren't going to enforce anything that the, the health department said. That they never had time, they never had the manpower, they weren't going to do it. But yet all the businesses invoked it, even though they, did, they didn't have to. They were told they didn't have to because nobody was going to be there if nobody complied. But they did it anyway. It, it, it was insane. It was also educational. I think it was that that showed me how alternative media is there to serve as the, the counter. They're, the anti is the same team as the pro. And antis don't like that. In, in my view, and in actuality, if you're an activist within the political horseshoe, you're in the mind control arena. And you can't just be a single issue. Like, I'm only brainwashing this issue, or I'm only an activist on this one issue. Because now you're aligning yourself with that worldview. That's why I've drawn such a firm line in the sand here with regard to uh, Q and nonsense and weather weapon conspiracies and that kind of thing. Because the people who fall for that are a different demographic. There's an entire shift that needs to happen first. That's a great point. And one of the things I saw through the shutdown, it's obvious the IPS has gone over this a million times, but uh, the 
nature of how the left-right dynamic was used from the very beginning, where there was initial doubt about the thing, and then uh, there was a gradual kind of reluctant move to say, okay, maybe there's something going on here. It's more than just a cold or whatever. Um, but that was masterful. I saw through that psyop how intricately they were able to manipulate the, let's say even, I, I hate to use the word skeptical in this case because no one was skeptical, but even for those that were questioning it just to a limited degree in the beginning, were slowly but surely brought along on this ride, more or less, over the course of about two years before it ran its course. And what was initially a doubtful scenario, they the right, you know, headed by the orange captain, was the one who really had the ability to morph that entire echelon of the right in the direction that they were cultivating and uh, really trying to manifest um, so that anybody who would gradually kind of look at it at the beginning was full on with the Trump salesman with uh, the pharmaceutical industry and so forth. By the end, he was the greatest salesman of all time. So that too, much like many other dynamics over the shutdown, really painted a, a more in-depth, more high-resolution picture of how they manipulate people uh, through the course of these events. In this case, a very long-term event, one of the big psyops. But it wasn't just full-on, let's turn on the lights and go for our end result. No, it took many months to watch that transition happen. It was fascinating. I think the anti-geoengineering group, like if you're uh, like, I'm not anti-geoengineering for a couple of reasons. One, geoengineering is not what geoengineering conspiracy theorists think it is. I've heard some say, well, have you heard of geoengineering? It's like, have you looked up <laughs> geoengineering? Geoengineering not only doesn't exist, it's a list of hypothetical yet to be developed processes by which they can combat climate change. As I call it, it's a fake solution for a fake problem. So geoengineering isn't really a thing, but in the imaginations of the right, they've conflated it with weather manipulation and HARP and Bill Gates phobia. They've conflated it into this monster, and now they're anti-geoengineering. And I would argue that anti-geoengineeringism is the same as anti-vax, where the controlled opposition is told, believe in the thing, but fear the cure. So the controlled opposition right believes in the V, they believe in the pandemics, they just think it was, it was created by China, but they're afraid of the cure. Now, when it comes to the climate change, now they believe in climate change on the right. They just think it was caused by geoengineering. Interestingly, geoengineering is the cure for climate change. So in both instances, they're against what the left sees as the cure, the problem that they both agree exists. This is like, it's mental jujitsu, where they get both sides to accept a really bad premise. And once they have them accepting it, they just fight over the cause. And what they're doing is they're blaming each other. Left blames private sector, right blames government. It is such a template. And it's important to point out the template and expose it for what it is so the people in it can start to appreciate how they're in a box. This is where auto hoax con, the auto hoax conventions come in, because we need to, on a case to case basis, guardrail by guardrail, go into some nuanced descriptions of what we're looking at, and then deconstruction, uh, taking things down, taking them apart. So I'm thinking, the next one is on the 26th, and I might use my slot, like a 90 minute slot to make the best case I possibly can that 9-11 was merely a movie from a meta script perspective. Not talking about engineers or jet fuel temperatures or any of these other red herrings. I'm just saying from a meta script perspective, and I make the case 
that this was a production, a movie production, superimposed over the news cycle. And I think that's going to be my focus because I want to differentiate what we're doing and what truthers do. They're bouncing off of mainstream views, thinking something happened. And we're noticing that we have come to appreciate the fact that alt and mainstream are, are making history via fake news. And we have to call it out from that perspective. So that's going to be the topic I'm going to focus on. And I'm also going to be in advance creating some additional content like like uh, for the, the visuals of these events. Because Auto Hoax Con number two, uh, I think, will be bigger than the first one. And I think we'll cover more ground. I have a lot of people reaching out. So uh, anybody here, by the way, if there's any specific topic that you think we need to address in Auto Hoax Con, anything you would like to see broken down succinctly, feel free to comment or let us know. And I'm sure somebody can get on it. I'm glad you brought up uh, number two, which I'm really excited about. I like your idea a lot. I think it's spot on to uh, expose that angle of 9-11. And um, if you're interested, we haven't really chatted about it outside of uh, the Patreon chat. But um, knowing what you're focusing on here uh, for a segment, if, you know, whatever time's available, if you and uh, all are interested, then I can uh, focus my, uh, let's say, uh, contribution, much like the last one, I can just center it in on aspects of 9-11 that really demonstrate that it is indeed a stage play. And ha- having watched probably tens of hours of uh, material from 9-11 for this documentary, which I have yet to release, and I'm probably just going to be doing short segments from here on out. But um, I watched hours and hours and hours of 9-11 stuff, and I'd already been aware that, of course, it wasn't a false flag. And along the way, I I started to seriously uh, doubt that anybody was injured at all, Um, not because I hadn't heard of that before. It's just something I hadn't tried to verify myself. But after watching all of this material, it was quite clear that it was just terrible acting, one terrible scene after another. And one that I've noted on a previous call, maybe over a year ago uh, with you, Tim, is that um, I watched uh, many of the scenes where the mayor was walking around the city, you know, (laughs) post-event. He has nobody guarding him. I mean, there's a big group of people, and he's a lot like some kind of Napoleon character, like pointing to people and being authoritative and like, we're going to go over here to the bunker. And like, this is all not secret. It's (laughs) being broadcast and recorded to the entire, at least New York City, if not the earth. And uh, it it was very, very, very clear at that point that all of it was contrived. But anyway, that's one of the things I can focus on if you and others are interested to try to let that be maybe a shorter segment of what I contribute is layering in some of that video material that that backs that up or the meta scripting aspect of it. You do have an extensive body of research on it. Um, I actually think what I'm probably going to do as more of a priority is maybe get into the Trump 713 head wound as a fake event from a meta script perspective. I might make that my focus because I have been finding so many connections between Trump, Nero, Joker, all these various scenarios that show the blending of the world stage fake events and the entertainment news. But I think it might make more sense for me to focus on the Trump head wound on this next one. But I do want to continue to examine all these events, quote, from a meta script perspective, not a false flag perspective, but a meta script perspective. And I think we make a much stronger case because now we're showing that the true culprits are the directors, that these events aren't even real, and that the narratives and the propaganda analysis that we go through reveals all this stuff. So that's, I'm probably going to focus on the 713 thing now that I think about it, especially in light of this latest Joker movie. Um, and, and of course, the findings in the Cape Crusader, where the Trump proxy gets his ear cut. Yeah, that's a great idea. Well, the 713 thing, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but the 713 thing, if you actually look at where the fake bullet was coming in, it looks like a plane and and Trump standing there like a tower. It would be almost in the same place 
that the 846 happened on 9-11. So just that's a really good connection. That out there. No, that is a great connection because you got George Bush on 9-11 and they're whispering into his ear. The bullets whizzing by Trump's ear. Same photographer, which connects these two ideas, 9-11 and the bullet. Then on his head, he has the 4547, which gives you 9-11. So in many ways, yeah, I think you're right. I think that is probably even intentional. That it does, it could be mistaken for a plane. That, that is interesting. And uh, I was just going to add as well that the, some of the video that I had been putting together, uh, just after the Trump scenario, I, I tried to get uh, an episode out on that, and I got overwhelmed by other things in life. But uh, there is so much material out there that compiling that was also something I've already done. So I could contribute that too if uh, it lined, if that's the target that you're going to be hitting. Yeah, that'd be excellent. I mean, because I think each one of these auto hooks cons is going to be very educational not just to people who already know what's going on, but to noobs that could be accessible because we are providing some pretty compelling evidence that there is a conspiracy. Like there is a conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy theory. But we have been conquered ubiquitously as a human race. There is a power elite. And people don't want me to say that. Don't say elite. Why not? They control your mind. Are they, and, and that's a descriptive term. And it has a lot of connotations with L and Saturn and the symbolism, the time-space control. And they control time and space. They control history because they write it. So at some point, we just need to recognize that this is a simulation and it does have builders. And what we are doing is we are exposing its architecture and its architects systematically. And anybody listening to Auto Hooks Con should be able to walk away especially if they're really informed about these things with even more certainty about what we're really looking at here. And I'm all about certainty and getting to conclusions rather than sitting out there in the fog of sci war and confusion and acting like confusion and asking questions is a replacement for enlightenment, which it's not. And a lot of truthers are like mind blown. I'm confused. This is so crazy. It's like, well, actually, it's not. It's propaganda, and it's high-tech, and we just need to figure out how it works. So I'm trying to keep everything objective, and we're providing a lot of, um, a lot of food for thought. You know, your last presentation, Reverse History, when you really got into the um, weeds there with the various narratives in individual cartoons, where yeah, there, there's no way this could be random. And the fact there's consistency and in multiple instances attributed to the same writers and directors, at this point, it's case closed. We're examining a meta-scripted, news-bent, world stage simulation. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, going back to your thought about the elites, um, I got into many conversations about this with people. Um, that the reason I use that word is because they are Lites. Uh, that's just how they describe themselves. They're probably yeah, they would use many other terms, you know, likely. But that seems to be an all-encompassing aspect. L being that Saturn relation and and other aspects of maybe one of their mystery religions uh, from afar. But yeah, uh, it is case closed. It's there. And going back to something else you were thinking about, maybe this would be a subject matter for future uh, auto hoax con, is that you inspired me to try to diagram how each side of the polarized sides look at an issue where maybe there was no conscious relation to something that they were trying to propagandize, that being the elite controllers, and yet they implant simultaneously uh, the same idea in each, but the approach to get there is you know, clearly different. But in the end, without anybody being aware, they do become aware of it. But like demonstrating those aspects of the writers and cartoons and so forth, I think it would be relatively, uh, you know, quote unquote, easy to take a lot of time to gather the sources, but to really tell the story from the left right dynamic and show those guardrails and how in the end oh you may seem like you have enemies of the other or the opposite but you all do really love each other because you do think the same way ultimately
anybody who just got here, uh, this is going to be uploaded into the usual podcast archives, and I will likely premiere it, and I'll promote the premiere. But yeah, this is going to be a twice a week podcast called the IPS Deep Think Tank. So it's open floor, any topics. But now we're kind of talking about Auto Hoax Con number two, and I'm inviting anybody to take a time slot and speak on a topic, present something, or suggest topics. And this is going to be happening on October the 26th. So a couple Saturdays from now. Just a heads up. Hey, um, okay, so I had a couple thoughts that might be a bit out of order, but like this synchronicity, and it's important to make a distinction between like the real experience synchronicities versus Metascript synchronicities. Um, and some of the obvious pointers on the Metascript is like the, the politicizing and, and um, obvious dichotomies that are mirrors um and as far as organic real synchronicities it's something that's personal and impossible um to be explained in any other way um so that's kind of a a real quick breakdown um I, i love the point you made about like you know human existence and how we all have the same inner core structure intuition spirituality thing going on like these people who claim to hate each other and they're at the bleeding edge of civil war you know ready to go whatever punch and kill each other for you know waving the other party's sign in their yard or something (laughs) and like when you actually deconstruct their ideologies, they're actually like generally good, benevolent people who want the best for themselves and the world around them. And, you know, it's important to, you know, I don't know, auto hoax misanthropy, perhaps, if that's the right word. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Great suggestion, V. That's awesome. I find that there's like an element of misanthropy built into the leftist paradigm and the right. The leftist paradigm has it that man is bad for Gaia. And it's largely because of our greed. It's because of our selfishness. We're not collectivist enough and we're destroying the planet. So you have this guilt trip built into progress, into consuming things, into doing well which is kind of like suggesting you embrace asceticism. And that's built into the left, and the idea is that man is intrinsically bad for Gaia and needs to expiate his carbon footprint. And you have climate confessionals. And it's a, a mirror of the other side, traditional values, that man is sinful and needs to purify himself of his sinful nature because sin will trigger the wrath of God. So both have the idea... That if individuals don't fix themselves, there's going to be collective punishment from the God construct. They, both sides agree that man is bad and needs to change to please God. Or man is bad and needs to change to please government or the collective. And so there's like misanthropy encoded into both sides. And it puts us, since man is low and bad, it puts us beneath the God construct. And then you look at, well, who made the God construct? Who created these myths? And I think that's a big part of how they get us to collectively genuflect to state power, to accept our lowly nature. It's a submission thing that, you know, we're bad. We all agree we're bad. And if you don't agree you're bad, you're in denial and you need to be saved. And so they have this built-in hatred for the other side.
Yeah, I think that's even in b- biblical scripture, to the, the the sides and all that. And, and I think that's their playbook. I honestly do. I do agree that it is their playbook. I mean, that is the the book in the Masonic Lodge, the, the Bible, that is. And the Bible myths, the Bible is a template for mind control, in my opinion. And so I look at Noah's myth, the Noah's, Noah's flood, as just having been brought back in this modern context. And I think many things take that form. But also on the esoteric side, you, you get into the, the black and the white pillar, the Masonic Lodge. That comes from King Solomon. It's all biblical lore, biblical symbolism. And it, it is one of the main sources of artistic inspiration. But I think that it goes into an initiated interpretation of what the Bible is. And I think that the power elite worship nature. I say pantheistic, but they worship nature. They're panpsychic, panpsychism. I don't think of them as uh, Satanists or belonging to one particular branch of the Abrahamic faiths. Like I look at Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and atheism as Abrahamic religions. And atheism, which is scientism and nasatology, is an iteration of the Abrahamic religions. It's all about Saturn, which is a symbol of time. And it's about time control. And I'm saying that they control time. They literally control time. They have time travelers, which are basically actors that they insert onto the world stage. They write the history, act it out on, on the stage in front of us, it goes into our history books. So in a very real way, they have asserted total control over time and I think space as far as like they, they make our, rather they write our maps, they write our borders. And if we're right about any of this, let's say we're right about everything. There's a unity in mind control from space on down. And this would include ISS as the biggest example. If this is all true, then it could be the case that countries are there as part of space control, preventing movement. Borders are there not to protect you from what's outside, but to keep you in your sheep pen so that the power elite can maintain control over history and geography, time, space. Yeah, I completely agree, Tim. Uh, I'll just jump in on one thought there and just say that to me, this is my interpretation, uh, just kind of coloring that a little bit and just saying that these are just open air human farms. Uh, They're arbitrary. They are meant to keep people divided. I can't help but, and and I think someone else, maybe uh, Portal or uh, Plain Decoded mentioned this before about the uh, hopium of extra lands outside or, or whatever's been mapped that we're aware of. And this is something that, becomes really pertinent to me is um, getting to a point where we can uh, get um, beyond those arbitrary borders. And I do, I mean, I'm not promoting anything per se here, but when I think about this in a fantasy way, uh, when I think about what I want, if you will, is to be a free man and go wherever I want and um, to have a passport and all these other things. These are parts of these balls and chains that hold people into their centrally managed areas, their space-time continuums that are devoted or made or conformed or controlled by these governments. So it's it's interesting to me. I appreciate that model as you just described it. And uh, ultimately, this is one of those things that as people become skeptical or begin to think for themselves, these borders really do start to dissipate. And I, I see that they are arbitrary in history for the sake of this control. And really, if, if you start looking at the fakery of wars and these other things, then it's clear it's just all part of the stage play. Yeah, and this also trickles down to the mind, right? The space of the mind. They, they control that too with a lot of people. I mean, not, not, pers- not saying they actually control it. They, they put the internet there for that control because people are you know not doing the things that they should be doing or would be doing spending time on the internet um 
just watching uh, one minute videos. So space, taking up space. You know, I don't think control is too strong a word to use here, mind control. Because if you look at interpersonal relationships, like in a cult, a family, or just a couple, if one person in a position of authority is a liar, they can selectively remove elements from reality from everybody else. They can remove their own indiscretions. They can prevent or rather present fake issues. They can manipulate money. There's so many ways to control people through lying. So at a basic level, if you buy into the internal model of the world that they give us, you're accepting a structure given to you by liars. And if you believe the liars, you are mind controlled. Uh, like Truman. In the Truman Show, wasn't physically held on the movie set. It was the mental construct of the world, built by lies, upheld by liars, that kept him from leaving. So I think that one of the most powerful forms of magic is lying. I, I have a manuscript I've been working on for a while called um, Lot, The Lie World Order, where I am suggesting that we are in a collective Truman Show. But it's not that it's a physical stage, but it's the mental stage, and it's held up primarily by lies. And as long as we fail to identify lies, have some nuance in our definitions, we're going to be spellbound. And one of Aleister Crowley's more famous grimoires is called The Book of Lies. And I was always put off by that. It's like, is he calling himself a liar? What does he mean by this? And having re-examined it, it has to do with this theory of magic being reality manipulation through essentially any means, by any means necessary, to affect change. And this includes acts of will. This includes manipulation. Various forms of magic don't involve candles and spells, but really just involves the use of symbols and words in order to manipulate the minds of others. And so I think lying is underestimated for the powerful weapon that it is. And yeah, also, I, when I, I, let's say one more thing here. It's just the lies by omission. So maybe they don't lie to you overtly over the course of an hour of news watching, but they omitted 95% of the stuff that's far more relevant that might convey something different. So they lie by omission more than anything. Yeah, and uh, my comment there is really just validating or echoing what you just said. Uh, the lying by omission is extremely important to their censorship uh, and their way of speaking. Those things they want people to focus on and the other 99.9 .9 billion percent of everything that's in reality is left out. Uh, but certainly just to underscore the idea of the new or the old lie world order, as I've heard you call it before, um, it is the method essentially of managing the mass consciousness. And I don't know how his name's pronounced. It's Epictetus or something like that. But um, liars are, are the reason for all ills in the world or something similar to that. And, and I see it as a fundamental for lack of a better word here, truth about the fact that this is how they create these demons of fiction and other aspects of fear uh, and all kinds of angles and aspects of life that no stone is left unturned with their miscoloring of reality, uh, all directed towards their news bent focus and, and ending or their kind of direction that they're hurting people in. But it is all based on the fiction, the lie, the uh, disconnection from reality. Yeah, great points. And in my forthcoming, I mean, I don't know, I don't have a publication date for, in mind for this. It's something that I'm just building up long term because I think it's a very complex topic. And you have different types of lies, different types of liars. You have witting liars, unwitting liars, you have propaganda mules, you have well-intentioned spreaders of mistruths, you have perceivers who are susceptible to uh, what I'd call sleight of mind or logical fallacies, visualized optical illusions, people who are deep fakeable, media illiterate, they can't tell real from fake, so they become de facto liars. Then you have liars by tradition, habit, 
and conformity. And, and so it ultimately what I'm suggesting is that stepping outside of the screen is primarily an act of true honesty. And it requires recognizing that I am dupable and I am or have been rendered, I have been, I have been made into a liar. The world made me a liar and I'm trying to unlie. And there's a pretty interesting movie called The Room about this kidnapped woman, or she's 17, kidnapped girl, in the shed based on a true story. And then she has a child in captivity. And to protect the child from the abuser, she tells him lies. She says, there's nothing outside of this room. This is the entire world. And so it's called Room. And when he reaches five, she believes at that point he's capable of escape. And she works out a plan with him to escape. It's all very symbolic. Like he has to get wrapped up in a rug. He plays dead. And then he, he's resurrected from the dead on the outside by escaping. And he sees this new wider world outside the box. But when she tells him, you're going to leave the room, he calls her a liar. He won't believe his mother if there's anything outside of the room that they're in. And she says, no, I was lying to you for your protection for the first five years, but now I am unlying. And I had never heard the word unlying before, so I wanted to add it to the lexicon because I think that's what we need to do individually. Uh, recognize where we've been lied to, what lies we've internalized, and we have to cease lying to ourselves. And logical fallacies are ways they get you to lie to yourself without knowing it because you just took an easy answer that was served in a way that made it very palatable. The fact is, logical fallacies turn you into a, a liar, a carrier of lies, whether you know it or not. This also reminds me of L. <laughs> just just the liar part of it. The L's upon L's upon L's. Of, of, of the layers of lies that, that we've um, had to endure, I guess. I've been referencing Frank Herbert's quote from Dune about how they're not mad they're believers. They've been trained to believe because knowledge is dangerous and belief can be manipulated. So um, the word belief, I know it's a cliche, it does contain the word lie in it, but I think that's very appropriate. That the believer is a liar themselves. In other words, they've accepted a truth that they can't verify. They've accepted what can only be logically described as a lie. They have good intentions. They have happy lies. They believe in this benevolent scenario. They believe in good things. Whatever, they believe in their own self-righteousness. So there's this idea that believers are intrinsically good people. They're doing the right thing. Or that beliefs are sacrosanct. And I say no. At this point, I'm done with people just asking questions. It's time to know. We're in the information age. We shouldn't settle for being mere believers. When we watch a guy on TikTok talking about how bad things are in this part of the country, but we shouldn't change our worldview according to his words. Let's say you believed all these FEMA crisis actors. Now your world model contains this new element. FEMA's out to get you. FEMA coffins, FEMA-controlled weather. Now you live in a different world because you've allowed them to alter your reality. And that's what magic is. Magic, fundamentally, is about ch causing changes in reality through magic, which is spellcraft, and spellcraft is ultimately comes down to your human, your, your will put into words, spelled out. Spellcasting is fundamentally about narratives and stories and memes. So it just seems to me that I think we live in a, a, a construct that we inter that, you know, this internalized construct that is very malleable. That lies affect it. That's why I was saying that the people who are under the authority of a liar are just programmed. They're totally controlled. And what we're in is a closed system, and there's a worldview monopoly. And the only acknowledged news or acknowledged worldviews out there are approved. 
And I think that's the main point here is that the the believers who accept everything on TV are conforming to a model that doesn't match the terrain. And to the extent that they're adhering to a model that doesn't match, I'm calling them liars, self-deceivers. And, the, you know, I get got some pushback on it because the word liar has so many negative implications, but that's all the more reason to use it, in my opinion. And truthers are liars. That's something else that can be said. It's because of their operating system. They have good intentions, they want to wake up the world, but because of their bad operating systems, because of their bad programming, truthers are just a subset of mainstream liars. That's a great point. Uh, Many great points. And one thing I'll add here, too, regarding magic and lies, uh, I agree with that sense of uh, application to how their control mechanism works. And uh, there's a a level of um, how people have been, well, one of the the basic ways that I've been able to synopsize this in a sense of how people's consciousness has been hijacked is that uh, there, let's just, you know, clear the slate and say there's a primordial man or woman and they're out in nature. Well, their mind is such a powerful tool that they have the ability to remember that, oh, one of our tribe members got eaten by a lion. So from now on, whenever they see a lion, that picture of a lion, they can prepare and probably defend themselves better than they would have otherwise. And on a very, very overly simplistic level, these controllers and mind manipulators have taken advantage of what is the great power, if you will, or potential of a human being is the mental capacity to map reality so much so that you can prevent death and and other aspects of your existence by knowing or projecting the potential of what you've measured in the past to apply it to the future. And on a very, very fundamental level, the controllers have hijack that one essence and instead of real lions or real bears or any other aspects even of nature actually which of course can be seen in its uh its actual impact in reality but they they have really at a fundamental level implanted these ideas and i think somewhere along the way this is something that i'd like to try to nail down in some of my future presentations is to show people how ideas are as real in this society as anything you can touch or see, and that's not healthy. That aspect of our great potential to imagine or plan or predict has been completely railroaded into fantasy. And it was talked about earlier in this deep think tank about the nature of how much of our of our society's lives are wasted uh, on the imaginary. And this is something I think as soon as some people have an ability to consider that their ideas are powerful, but it, it's now a prerequisite for anything you contemplate going forward to divine whether that's a, a something connected to reality or whether it's you know something out of a, a stage play or a comic book or something completely intangible and, and totally disconnected from reality. Yeah, I've introduced the term hyperstitions to deal with these. So the hyperstition refers to, and this is from a website, if I look just a general meaning of it, definition is beliefs or stories through their very existence and dissemination bring about their own reality or truth. So, for example, the uh, space junk phenomenon. You know, there's so many stories that it's there, people are talking about it, and eventually it just becomes an accepted part of our world. Like it's an accepted part of our world that space junk is a real thing, yet none of us have actually seen it or examined it. All of our information is coming from the same sources, but it's been given a stamp of approval. It's like we're in the desert of the designated real. They designate something real. In the simulation, it's suddenly real. And most people live in a world of hyperstitions. And I think this is also another part of it, too, is that Hyperstitions are reinforced by the dominant paradigm. They all kind of nod their heads and agree. And you can see this in churches. where They reinforce each other's religious experiences or UFO cults. Oh, I got abducted. Oh, me too. Did you get probed? Yeah, me too. And they have this chorus that builds a false consensus in an environment 
that promotes that belief. So I would call those hyperstitions more than superstitions because hyperstition implies a cybernetic relationship. There's a loop going on. And this is similar to what uh, Polybius wrote when he was talking about the use of superstition, maintaining the cohesion of the Roman state. I would say hyperstitions maintain the cohesion of our modern world that the PSYOP entertainment complex introduces and reinforces the existence of modern superstitions. And I'm calling them hyperstitions because unlike ghosts and werewolves, which they no longer reinforce, these are things that are uh, constructs that have um, like our uh, modern replacements for previous superstitions. So for example, flood myths, angry gods replaced by something that's caused by something we can measure with science, like climate change, for example. So hyperstitions are what maintain the cohesion of the state or the stage, the world stage. It gives us the parameters. Those are great points. And just to add a little bit to that, uh, one note is that it also has to include uh, the polarization. Interestingly, it doesn't have to be that everybody is uniform and has the same religion or perspective on any of this. And I mean, it's been measured and noted just countless times within the political horseshoe and many other examples and media fakery and all of this stuff. But it's so important that the uh, people being controlled are uh, basically having uh, artificial enemies made out of what would potentially otherwise be friends or people that they could actually collaborate with. So it's fascinating that the hyperstitions in all of their various forms uh, have a built-in uh, almost enemy complex <laughs> or people who want to um, oppose them or their imagination, even their nightmares. They they hold on to in, in that kind of polarized way. But just fascinating that the, it doesn't have to be one uniform hell or heaven for the entire population. It's this uh, complete fraction or fractionalized, I can't think of the word, but uh, it's basically dismembered across, but uh, that's part of the division and part of the divide and conquer scenario. But the hyperstitions, I agree, are completely the, the substrate of what um, gets people motivated to cling to these abstractions uh, so vehemently. Sure. Uh, yeah, you know, a really good example is the movie, uh, the the village. It's, they're called the elders. The elders lie and tell all the believers in the village that the village is surrounded by monsters in the woods, so you can't leave. And so they're told about this. They have drills, and in the drills, they're locked down in basements, and they hear the monsters banging on the door. And these are analogous to hyper-realistic school shooting drills. The children are in a room, and they hear someone kicking the door, and it's an actor, of course, in the drill. But what they do is they implant really strong emotions attached to the idea of this threat they have to lock down for. Then they have this belief in the monsters. You have drills to reinforce the terror. And then once in a while, the elders will provide evidence, like, for example, a mutilated animal in the woods. Now we have evidence that there are monsters out there. And the monsters don't exist. These are costumes that the elders wear when they're prancing around in the woods at night. But in the minds of the villagers, monsters are real, and you can never leave. And so their worldview is constrained. It has a very small border. They live in a village, and they never leave because this hyperstition, which is reinforced by community belief and occasional psyops. So when they provide dismembered, mutilated animal, that's a psychological operation that reinforces the fake thing. No different than a school shooting. Reinforces the existence of the mentally ill mass shooter. So their hyperstitions are used, again, to create parameters, to create borders, to keep people locked in. And that movie expertly, I think, really demonstrates, more than any movie I've seen, in a microcosm, how the world really works. I completely agree, and uh, I, I don't want to take away from anybody else's commentary, so I'll just say that, to me, that movie is uh, one of the biggest tells out there of just putting it in people's faces. We talked a little bit about this over the Auto Hoax Con number one, 
but they uh, the people who design these things seem to like to flaunt these ideas right in people's faces in fiction and fantasy perspective. And uh, if people really looked at that very critically, that is a perfect model of what's happening now. Yeah, that one deserves a watch party. I like to analyze the characters because the three people who see through it, one is the village idiot and he finds the monsters amusing. So he doesn't have any fear. So he's immune. He's mind war inoculated because he's not afraid. Uh, the other one is the uh, visually impaired. She's blind. So she can't see the propaganda. And if you can't see it, it's harder to build the analogous internal structure. The hyperstitions don't work. So she too is impervious to the mind war. And the other guy, uh, Lucian, played by Joaquin Phoenix, is a critical thinker, lots of intuition, and he doesn't trust authority. And the three of them escape, basically. The three of them inadvertently get through their matrix, and it's because they weren't conformists. But it just kind of shows, like, well, who sees through it and why? And what made you capable, or what caused you to... Um, Cease believing the elders. The elders represent the media. Yeah, and even the parents, as I recall watching that movie, which I was exposed to through the IPS and your work, I watched it all the way through, and uh, there was at the end a kind of apology from the parents, like, oh, well, we had to do this because the alternative was worse. It's almost like these Methusian, uh, Malthusian kinds of people who say, oh, population is way too big and we're going to fail by the nature of just reproducing. But uh, it's fascinating that even the controllers were saying, no, this is the lesser of the evils that, and, and the only path forward that we could make. And a lot like I've heard you talk about this, Tim, uh, on occasion, um, but I've seen this as well, which is these controllers, and maybe it's even just for their insiders, to get them to be motivated. Like, oh, this is the best solution for humanity, is to lie to them and make up these silly stories so you can get paid a lot and just go along with the program, and the alternative would be everybody dies. <laughs> and uh, so, in a way, whatever their motivation is, they definitely do try to put themselves in the moral high ground. And even in the movie, they talk about taking that command or that kind of control over other people's free will. People are born into it. They never have any idea, or like you say, those prominent characters, which is interesting how they archetype each of those characters who can see through the matrix. Um, but ultimately, they... They have this uh, recalcitrance to go um, to the point of saying, oh, well, we should have informed you from the beginning that we're lying to you so you could eventually be self-reliant or self-aware. And this is something, of course, and just a quick note on this, is that the academic systems, everything that we're ever taught, hobble us from even thinking critically about any of this stuff. So... As a slave culture, it definitely is left out of the story. And here we are. I mean, I'm one of these people who basically believed everything I was ever taught from a young age and then eventually started to become aware that the stories were inconsistent and contradictory. And that to me, as I value or I measure my own self-awareness to whatever degree I've attained, and I assume I have a lot more to learn before it's all said and done, that I very much more appreciate being aware of how this place works and how people are manipulated than being uh, like a cipher character in the Matrix just eating steak every day with a big smile on my face. But it's interesting how the elite or the people within that movie, particularly the village, um, do take on the elite perspective and... Uh, and in a way, uh, offer their apology, but saying that we're, we're going to do it because it is the moral high ground and that's all there is to it. Uh, screw any sense of your self-will or ability to potentially even create something better because we already figured it out. Yep, that would be the rationale. Um, the idea that you had superstition to maintain the cohesion of the state was based on their belief that the masses are fickle, full of lawless passion, and they need to be constrained by fear of God. So this is an old concept, and in the village they were basically informed that the world out there is so terrible that we want to create a paradise for you. 
So they took away their free will in exchange for uh, paradise. And it's like, well, would you want to know? I detected something else about the movie where the village are surrounded by bushes with red berries. And they're programmed from when they're young that that is the bad color. And if you see that color, go back to the village. So it's kind of like how in the Garden of Eden, you're supposed to avoid the tree of knowledge. Let's say like, like the apple, like a red pill, the red fruit. You avoid that because if you have that, then you know too much and you can no longer stay in the garden. You're no longer welcome. You have no, you're like the gods, is what they say. So in the village, they go past the red and they find out they're in the 20th century. So now they're like the gods. They're equal to the elders and they can no longer stay unless they want to serve the system. And so at the end, yeah, they're given a breakdown that we have to control everybody to create a perfect world because the world out there is so terrible and you can no longer stay here since you know how it works. And they're, have, they're basically given a deal. You know, exit or become part of it and wear a monster costume and become a terrorist. So it's, it's like Stockholm Syndrome or something here. But what, whatever it is, there, there is some kind of aspect to it where they give themselves the license to be the monsters and the terrorists in order to uh, protect the people inside. And it's, it's rooted, though, in misanthropy. You know, to bring that comment back, you mentioned misanthropy. The idea that we're so terrible that we need to be shackled to a false worldview and we need to be terrorized by superstitions, like that idea is not new. And I think it's rooted in this concept that man is just a terrible, unruly creature that can't be told the truth. And I, I dispute that, at least for myself personally. Um, I don't know if it's true regarding the masses. You know, maybe this is a benevolent dictatorship. I'm open to that idea. Yeah, my quick thought, and maybe this is just totally my reflection of of my perception that um, I I don't give them any credit. Now, maybe they're maybe that's true, and I do see that possibility. So I'm not discounting it or eliminating it for the the potential real or motivation of why this whole thing plays out the way it is uh, today. But in in my core interpretation so far, and I'm willing to update this sense of or my model of reality. But it just does boil down to me in the most fundamental way of slave masters versus slaves. Um, it's no more complex than that. They wield their uh, power at will. It seems to me that this has been going on for a long time because, and I mean many, many, many generations. And I, I conjecture about that in that way because it's just so such a well-oiled machine that I don't think it needs to be any more complex. But... You know, I know what it's like for me to be free and what it's like to pursue that which I do with a clear mind and, and the Ataraxian kind of perspective of not being weighed down by any of their false nightmares and, and false witness uh, events that they portray. And so I'm way more creative. I'm way more active. I sleep better at night. And, and here, I think even participating in this forum is an example of what fruit is born from uh, that perspective. So, and, and I, I, one quick note on this, if I were to measure, you know, the potential of this being a beneficial dictatorship, that, um, yeah, it's not served me in any way that's beneficial for me. And maybe I'm the outlier, like I would be the one and many people here might put themselves in this category. But, you know, my freedom somehow creates the dissonance or uh, terror that they're trying to protect against. And I think that that on a logical framework falls apart because, uh, you know, speaking from a place of uh, let's say, self-designed morality, one that I would hope other people would accept as good, um, is something that is is my internal uh, ability to you know be a part of this social realm. So it would be, to me, uh, a lost opportunity or a complete denial of that which I freely designed for myself and or freely collectively collaborate with others that a Malthusian controller or a beneficial dictator would otherwise delete me as they've done figuratively and actually, uh, you know, within the social media continuum, as I know the IPS has suffered so many times. So just the rounding out of that thought is that 
it's it seems abhorrent to me that there's some good that can come out of this kind of control. Uh, that's my initial reaction. But I also measure my reaction with the fact that when I'm disconnected from any of their madness, uh, my life is so much better. And that which I have the opportunity to discuss or create with others is infinitely better than it would have been otherwise. Can I ask you a question? Um, do you think that the majority of the population are followers? And so, therefore, the elite, so to speak, have to do something to keep them in check, so to speak. If you're uh, asking me that, Linda, um, my quick answer is that's a great question. <laughs> and I have given this a lot of thought. I'd love to hear the rest of the panel's thoughts on this too. But my my reaction is that if, if for instance, they just shut down the PSYOP entertainment complex today, what would that world be like? And because of the amount of time I've spent measuring people's perspective uh, and the fact that they do not think for themselves and as adults, most, you know, many from uh, young adulthood through the end of their lives have never thought for themselves on a fundamental level. And I, I can't help but think, and this is just a thought game. I'm not projecting that I would ever participate in something like this. But it just so happens that I see, I've measured that the IPS, uh, Tim's work, uh, is so accurate in its reflection or this modeling of how this social uh, control environment works that uh, it takes a certain level of self-awareness to really see these wheels turning. And while and getting back to the thing I was just going to suggest is that we have the power, literally. This might be the thing that the controllers are most fearful of. It's not that we understand how it works. It's that we could literally hijack their system and do it better than them and, and uh, basically funnel these majority of people, as you referenced, in any direction we want. Now, that's, of course, not a part of my direction or will. I, I have no interest or time in any of that. But just to go to your point, and I'd love to hear other people's perspective on this, that the majority is indeed hobbled like i mentioned before they've been uh mentally handicapped in such a severe way that i would not trust just turning off the psyop lights and see what happens over i'd rather have that i'd like to see that experiment play out i'd rather have that than the daily terror but at the same time it i think and this is why this work with the ips is so important that the philosophic foundation, I think, has to precede any sense of real freedom or celebration of freedom. So if we did unleash those chains, I think there would be, it would be interesting to see what happened, but I would have no faith that that majority could figure anything out really quickly. I think it would take an effort like this and a very conscious will to um, try to uh, design something adequate that you know people could graduate from being an ignorant being to be one that's self-directing but i think it to me they're capable of it it's just a matter of how you go about trying to to um, educate people about how powerful their own will and action is and something that they can fill in the void of their imagination with the real i think that takes as much teaching as it taught them to become disconnected from reality if that makes sense well i mean I, <clears throat> i've I have my own opinions about all this stuff, but I mean, me as a young child, I asked questions and I didn't get the satisfactory answers that I wanted, right? So I kept asking. And when I was denied answers, it, it, it was frustrating. I don't think a lot of these people ask questions. That's what I'm saying. They don't ask questions. They just submit from the beginning, if that makes sense. And so, therefore, they don't have the, the honest questions to lead them in the right direction. I agree. And that's partially what I was uh, leaning towards when uh, I was thinking or trying to convey the idea of people... Uh, who let's just say you could turn the lights out of the PSYOP entertainment complex, what would be the first thought in their mind? And this is where that handicapped aspect comes into play. No, I, I don't think people really have um, mastered this, what I would 
find to be a natural potential, which has been artificially reduced to nothing, more or less, uh, that they they would need. I, I, and this is just a guess. This is just a total projection. But based on the fact that nobody does it right now anyway, I would say that one um, that that people are not um, taught or they're not given the tools to understand how they were manipulated. So if you just stop the information flow, they would still be left without that skill being developed. It, it, they would be like babies, basically. That's how I would see it. Now, babies can be taught how to you know, understand the world, but these babies are in adult bodies who you know, really have no skill or ability to navigate uh, the real or celebrate it the way that I think we are, or at least the realm of skeptics would when really trying to divine the real out of uh, say fiction. But I, I agree with you. I've had the same experience, Linda. Well, I mean, the only reason that I'm bringing this up is because I was raised in, in a situation. My mother was basically a narcissist, right? That I never got to ask the questions, even though I had them in my head, right? I, I had the questions and nobody would... Um, answer my questions and I was punished sometimes for asking the questions and and she was very religious which I did not agree with I thought that was all bullshit even from a young age so how did I overcome all of that when the masses of the people can't overcome that and they had better lives than me probably the majority so, yeah, I'm thinking this place may be balanced in a way that w that is unknown to us at this point, so to speak. You both raise a really great point here about how immersed we are. It's what I, you know the sea of irrelevance thing, where there's so much information that you can shout the truth out, and it doesn't matter. Because people don't have the right context to understand it. You can say something point blank that is 100% true. Let's say, for example, nobody landed on the moon. And it doesn't enter into their worldview. Because uh, that's not an acknowledged perspective. They're not able to assimilate it. But even if they did, it's like, well, what does this mean? Like with the flat earth topic, you know, people are like, well, if it is flat, what does it even mean? They can't go the next step on their own. They're asking you to tell them. And I saw that as an indication that these are people who get their information in a passive way. So mainstream media has passive consumers. Alt media has passive consumers of alt media. The difference between passive media consumption and criticism and skepticism is we are active consumers. We are parsing the information first so that based at the end of this, what it, what it means is that passive consumers cannot reframe their worldview and they can't add anything in that doesn't come from a source. They're not the arbiters of what they believe. They're mind controlled. They are delegating a part of their perception to an external authority and that's not the truther. Because the truthers are designated as you know the enemies of the state. So shouting the truth out doesn't work on those who aren't to understand it and put it in the right context. But the best we can do, I think, and this is what AutoHooksCon is for, is we provide a new model. You have to start with the model. So it's like we're, we're looking at a worldview monopoly, and when you see the model, then you can separate your own perceptions from it. But if you're in the model, if you're on the wrong side of the screen and you're taking the screen literally, no amount of truth is going to make a difference. It's just going, it's going to not stick. And we've all experienced this. Uh, anybody who's ever delved into conspiracy theory or trutherism has experienced this bizarre, it's almost like you're witnessing mind control in action. It's, it's almost unsettling. When you say something to somebody that makes perfect sense to you, it's a realization you've had, and you get a blank stare or they change the subject to something completely mundane, like it doesn't stick. It doesn't stick because they're in the model. It's like they're dreaming. They're inebriated. My, my point here is elucidate the model. Expose that there's a map. 
And once they can see the map, then you can show them, or you can then you can draw some some meaning out of the fact that the map doesn't match the territory. But the, one of the biggest accomplishments of the PSYOP Entertainment Complex is in convincing people that the worldview they're given is an accurate model of the world. When it's really a model based on omission, infused with hyperstitions, and it's completely censored and curated. Uh, I agree with that entirely, and I've heard you talk about it previously, Tim, and this is certainly something that I've uh, come into a sense of realization about, that until people have this philosophic uh, connection or understanding or this elucidation of the model, as you just so aptly put, then they don't have the tools they need to navigate the world of information. And by disseminating uh, this kind of um, model or logical framework of analysis, then it gives people a real concrete tool to test. They don't have to even look at auto hoax con and go, okay, well, this is the truth, or this is how I should think, or this is how I should interact with the world of information and make real world decisions. It, it boils down to uh, having um, the ability to, to be presented with this rock solid methodology and examples of it and whatever people present or uh, share and, and then go test it. And that's the beautiful thing about what I see out of the effort of this collective, which I think is the best on earth. Is this think tank is that uh, the uh, model and methodology can be um, logically subsumed. It makes sense, but even more so it can be applied. And once it's applied, the, the fruit can be born from that. Uh, and of course, people may reject it anyway because they're not ready maybe for reality yet. But this is the first step. I completely 100% agree. And the reason I say that is because I know too many people in my real life that um, would not even begin to make their first decisions on uh, anything that they personally desire to see or anything they personally invent, which I think many people do that I've talked to. They have fantasies of making the world better. But like you were saying earlier, it's this programming from the external. There are two... Uh, well, programmed into that way of thinking that they have yet to really turn on the inside and trust their intuition and whatever it is they personally design or develop and have faith that that is something worth pursuit. But anyway, the auto hoax con uh, type of um, communication is a great foundation block, a, a, a cornerstone using the Mason's terminology for anything that follows. It has to be at the very foundation of the building. Yes, the stage. And I think the world stage is such an apt metaphor because we can describe it as the world stage is the place where the worldview monopolists focus their, their lens, their, their camera is focused at the stage. And you can take an off-world stage perspective, which means you get off of it and you recognize it as such. But until you take the off-world stage perspective and reject the authority of the screen, you are on the stage and in the model. So you're a simulation dweller. And this is why I've been saying lately that simulation theory is a psyop. That simulation theory is a false mysticism designed to lead people who see the discrepancies into thinking everything's fake instead of seeing the discrepancies as indication that we're being lied to. So it's kind of like a... Um, Almost a contingency plan. Okay, if anybody sees through this and they think it's all BS, they're just going to think that the universe is BS. The universe is glitchy, like the Mandela effect. The Mandela effect would believe that reality itself is no longer objective, no longer follows rules, and it's always changing. That's not a move towards truth. And the Mandela effect, or the Mandela affected, will never try to uh, reverse engineer that. They will stick within their paradigm and they're kind of like, it's, it's, a, it's a dead end. And the Mandela effect is essentially what you would call the misinformation effect. It's a form of manipulating recollections. But I would point out too that the mainstream media 
uses the exact same methodology that creates the perception of, quote, Mandela effects every day. But it's actually called the misinformation effect. So another side effect of being constantly inundated with so much media and, and fake news is that it does influence our perceptions of the world. It does influence our recollections in subtle ways. And so the key thing, again, is, is to step away from the stage and take the off-world stage perspective. And we, we can use truth or orthodoxies and other indicators to show that somebody's not off the world stage. Like if you're still running around terrified of Bill Gates, you're on the stage. He's one of their characters. And the more we make this distinction, the easier it will be for people to let go of the stage and to actually get off of it. Like, hey, you're not fighting Bill Gates. You're not fighting Venezuelan gang members. Kamala Harris is not going to take you to a FEMA camp. You have to disconnect all these narrative threads. And when you do, you step off the stage. Um, and, and from our perspective, we're looking at the scripting. And that takes us into the realm of being not only off the stage, but insiders, how it all works. And I think this is the approach that's going to work. We're giving truth. And facts, but putting it in a context where it makes sense. The raft above the sea of irrelevance. Everybody in the sea of irrelevance, especially truthers, yeah, they're inundated with truth. But it's like signal to noise ratio is so bad for every fact they get, it's drowned out by 90 mistruths or deep fakes. So they're they're lost, lost at sea. And what we offer here, I think, is a clear perspective. And it's fundamentally a paradigm shift to go from being a believer to a knower. So what we're doing here is not ideological as much as it's a philosophical change. Projecting belief in exchange for a, a, an operating system and a methodology. Well said. I was thinking about what you, the idea of low information versus high information belief, and also how maybe a challenge, maybe like how like how did I get this far, right? How how did I personally get out of the village, so to speak, um, get past the false dichotomy of the the yellow safe color, red bad color, and all that? It's a great movie, by the way. Um, but it, a few experiences, you know, I thought like when I was younger, I experienced like censorship from authority figures um, and that changed the direction of my life a little bit. Um, and also like this idea that I carry personally that I, ch I challenge people like how do you, how do you value belief? When you say you believe something, like, do you respect that belief, you know? And how do you have integrity to your belief system? Like how we, how we say, you know, if you can't tell me why you believe it, what does it matter? You know, like you're not self-aware enough to understand the system of determining whether you believe something or not. Like you haven't gone through that yet to like, you know, codify it more or less. Um, and so like, some people could like like how you know these um you know truthers or whatnot they'll they'll call out the space fakery but it's like meaningless to them because they don't have they don't value like they'll believe okay yeah nasa's faking space they 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 believe the fake ability but they don't have any context to put that in so it just becomes another irrelevant infographic and fundamentally, it's still this like oppressive new world order, and, and they're not like applying the model, you know. And so that's what where it's demonstrated their lack of the the full model of skepticism, you know. And it it's the cause, the reason why they're not motivated to develop a model is because they don't value their belief, they don't value their choice to believe or not. And so like, and especially like if you're a religious person, like. If you subscribe to any one particular religion, 
like the I, I it reminds me of that example of like how like and especially with the reputation of Islam and then they shut down they're like oh we're not going to walk around the giant black cube this year because you know rona um and so like how much do they do they believe in Allah how much do they value their belief in in the Muhammad and the Quran to like behave that way or like the you know the the kim trailers who don't wear masks or in vape and all this stuff um and so that's the challenge and if like you take on that challenge that could potentially guide you to this think tank or some creating your own similar think tank of a parallel type media i don't know just my thoughts <laughs> Yeah, all very good. Uh, very good points. And I think one of the things that we're doing here, it's, it's almost a marketing tactic where we distinguish parallel media as a third branch of media. You got main and alt, and now you have this third branch. And we define ourselves as having a culture of disbelief. We are non-believers. And by making the statement, I'm a non-believer, a believer is going to have to be challenged. Well, am I a believer? I can point out, well, yeah, you believe this and this. Why? So we can start attacking their beliefs, undermining their faith, which is what we have to do. I think we have to approach this as though we were a group of atheists in a theocratic society, and we want to overthrow it. Uh, we want to change the paradigm. And even though I'm not advocating literal atheism, I'm saying that we have to disbelieve in their God constructs, their creation myths, and depose their priesthood and reject all of their false teachings. And that's kind of what we're doing here. So in a way, this is a, a neo-enlightenment. It's a reframing of worldview itself. And I think it can take off. I'm not sure what the long-term effects are, but I do think that as from a marketing perspective, the more people who fill in parallel media, the bigger its internal economy gets, uh, the more noise it makes. The more people who are on the fence or didn't know they were on the fence will join us. Like we can see exponential growth in what is tantamount to a new philosophical movement that is outside of the controlled paradigm. There's nothing that can stop it. You know, I mean, we have little annoyances like their attempts to ban and censor. But becoming a separate media ecosystem means that censorship is going to be a thing of the past when it comes to what we're doing, we don't need to breathe their air. And so the unacknowledged, the off-world stage perspective is going to go ahead and grow off to the sides while they try to manage their little sheeple. And at some point, this is why I say the crack go in. The raft gets so big, it's like a kraken, where they won't be able to ignore it. And then when it decides to move across the land and uh, I would say test the integrity of the world stage infrastructure, things can get fun. Because in my opinion, a committed group of free thinkers who have figured this out uh, can turn into something big enough to cause uh, an interesting reaction. We'll make a splash because my goal is to see what happens. Because like, I don't know, but I think we can, we can test it. And I want to see if we can do a billion dollars in damage to the mass media infrastructure. As in, it'll cost them a It'll cost them a, a NASA's annual budget to do damage control for what we're unleashing. This is a one-way thing. The instant, you're, the instant you flip that switch, you've stepped outside of the screen, you recognize the meta script and how we've all been gamed, you're not going to fall right back into it. If you leave a religious cult and you understand it and you've separated from it intellectually and emotionally, you're not going to fall for future cults. So this is mind war inoculation. I don't think it's been done at this scale or at the scale that I think we can blow it up to. Right now, it's sort of small, but it's notable that we're the only ones doing this. I look forward to see what happens in the future. And I uh, want to say thanks to everyone here, by the way, for listening, commenting, and adding to the conversation. I think it's just going to get more interesting as we go along. Indeed. And now uh, I can't help but think when that billion dollar damage comes around that uh, is it even possible for NASA CGI to get any worse? And that'll be a lot of fun to watch it go further down the tubes.
I think it's there. There's a kind of an inside joke here with the whole insider concept because we're borrowing from the the the, uh, the slogan from Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, which means ignite, and he's the one who's credited with saying, "Go forth and set the world on fire." And I think what we're doing is we're building up to a point where we're going to go forth and set the world stage on fire. Where we set so many fires. This is like out of the art of war, where you set a fire, and while they're distracted putting that one out, you go attack something else. And I could see a, a multi-pronged campaign that is ceaseless, decentralized, and unstoppable. There'll be so many fires, they won't be able to put it out. And I think it's going to be fun, which is a huge, hugely important aspect of it. You know, counter, counterculture should be fun, or especially if you're doing so you know, with the... Um, right intentions and for the right reasons but the contrived controlled opposition is not only not fun you're a miserable propaganda mule full of toxic mind viruses if you go with the establishment friendly counter so i'm looking very much forward to the future here and i don't think a billion dollars is too much to aim for i i I, when i say a billion dollars in damage i mean it's going to cost a lot of money and a lot of opposition think tanks uh, to come up with ideas on how to counter what we're doing. And we've seen indications of it. I think when Elon Musk agreed that space looks like CGI, it's not a concession. That was an attack. That was them trying to co-opt one of our best observations and twist it. They're trying to gaslight it. So I, I think we're making progress already because I do see indications that there's pushback against people who see Sorry. Okay, I, I'm going to make this quick. Um, Elon, Elon, sh- he should know this. I, I, I bet he watches the stream or has people. Anyway, um, it, it's a rule from a place that some people go to. It says you can't you can't in before your own post. And, and what that means is like if you're going to say something, and, and then while you're saying that, you already know what someone's going to criticize, and then you counter that criticism. You know, like, or like, you know what the first, because NB4 is what someone posts as a reply. And so if you, because you didn't give a chance, because like, like you, you, someone would make a post and they say, look, NASA put a satellite in space. And then the very first response to that post is going to be fake and gay. And so what Elon did is he like, look, I put a satellite in space in before fake and gay and and you can't actually do that um just a formality that elon should know um anyway i'm gonna i'm gonna stop talking in v4 yeah great point he wants to co-opt anybody who's going to state the obvious and then he makes it a point for his side so i agree with all my skeptics it looks fake but it's real i mean i think it's brilliant because he's pulled this off he's done it twice and now Everybody can say it's fake, and we agree with the guy who's faking it, but it's real. It's just, it's just like, it's clever. It shouldn't be effective, but it is. And, of course, he has ownership of this massive platform, which is reality control in a large way. And I think it's pretty, um, from, a, from an anthropologist's perspective, it's interesting to look at these big psyops that follow a big event, like this, this hurricane thing. Look at how many people were just pulled into this alternate reality game where, oh, look, the Haitians are eating cats and Bill Gates is controlling the weather and Venezuelan gangs are taking over apartments and children are being transported in big barriers and the union workers are trying to free the children. That's a very interesting and complex and scary world that they all got dragged into the power of doom scrolling on X. And this is by design. Because if, if space is actually, if the space program is about controlling the inner space, the space between your ears, Elon Musk is one of the top space program um, uh, figureheads. It makes perfect sense that he's right there on top of mass mind control. Uh, same thing with Bezos. 
Amazon. You know, Amazon does have some creative, or rather some um, curation power, some censorship power, maybe not directly. He's not there anymore, but the connection between the space program and mass mind control, something to emphasize, because that's what the point of the space program is. It's not to take you to Mars. It's to convince you that the way that we would live on Mars is ideal. Let's live on Earth as we would on Mars, and people are buying it. So... And I agree with the idea or the the reality, actually. It's not just an idea or ideal, but uh, the fact of the matter is, from my experience, that um, so-called, quote-unquote, waking up to the real world has uh, been one of the greatest joys of my life. And I think, interestingly, and I'll leave this for maybe further in-depth contemplation on another conversation, but it is fascinating to consider what ops, and I don't want to give them any ideas, of course, but um, what ops they would have to, what lengths they would have to go to to counter a movement that's about reality. And as far as this group is communicated, some kind of benign morality, you know, there's no, I don't see anybody kind of putting any kind of scrolls in front of me to follow any directives or uh, uh, whatever uh, Mosian kinds of laws there would be. But uh, this has been and is continuing to be a ton of fun. And just, Living in reality itself is uh, something that can be enjoyed. I know there's all kinds of things that can happen. I've experienced all kinds of ups and downs in my life. But the approach that they would have to take to deny people who actually are accurately expressing reality through their words and actions and presentations, uh, first of all, that's undeniable. But the other part is that it is benign and it is really fun. So how they demonize that, I'll leave it to them to figure that out. But uh, certainly they've got creative minds capable of coming up with something. But it just feels like it's always going to fall short. Yeah, exactly. They're they're armed and, and ready to go against the alternative believers. They have nothing to say to the non-believers. They can't grasp it. As we're outside of their purview, we're easily able to co-opt the space skeptics, the NASA critics, the flat earth group. I mean, there's 11 million, quote, flat earthers in Brazil. The numbers are huge, and this just means these are millions of people who question the dominant paradigm and the source, and they become skeptical about media. And they were able to co-opt that and run it into the ground, to stop it from becoming a, a movement of any kind. It wasn't able to accomplish very much. It's just, at this point, it's pretty clear that they sabotaged it because they saw its power. But they had people in place. It was like a limited hangout. What we're doing, however, doesn't have any representation on the world stage. There isn't any hold where they can just jump in and say, yeah, we're auto hoaxers and we want to do these bad terrorist things. Like, they can't just broad brush us. And so we're outside of their purview, we're above their pay grade, outside their area of expertise. So we're just going to quietly amass and grow and grow. And as a, a movement, it has an intellectual high ground. It's an operating system, not an alt belief system. We have a moral high ground. Not to mention, I think also a moral imperative to push back against lifetimes of programming. But that's going to happen when we have the numbers. 10,000 Auto hoaxers set loose in a targeted way will be unstoppable. There's no guardrail, there's no influencer, and there's no conspiracy that we can't go after with a, a concentrated focus and do immense irreparable damage to. We can discredit people. We can destroy controlled opposition documentaries. We can blow up narratives when we have the numbers. The numbers are everything. That's just, that's just a huge, that's a big part of how this place works. But if you can imagine a, a top-tier influencer on the far right, let's say a Tim Pool, you know, he would never talk to us. He would never acknowledge the validity of our perspectives. Well, someone like that, confronted with thousands of people, maybe many of them members, they will find it impossible to avoid us. And at some point, they're going to have to acknowledge the auto-hoaxers. And by the time the auto-hoaxer is recognized as, an, as a being, It'll be too late. We will already have established ourselves through multiple conventions, publications, think tanks, which will splinter into additional think tanks. And additionally, we're going to have 
a, a nice documentary at some point, the auto hoaxer, so that when this goes viral, we define it, we control it, and they won't know how to react. I think this is going to be funner than when the flat earth meme went viral. And we made it go viral. It, it came out of the IPS. We did it with billboards. We did it with events and conferences. And then it was slowly co-opted by a more establishment-friendly conspiracy theorists with deep connections. Yeah, agreed with the plan. That sounds fantastic. Uh, perfectly modeled and uh, indeed just a super ton of fun about to be had and, and being had. I'm going to leave this open, by the way. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to shut down this Discord, but I'm going to let Craigbot go. He's the one who does the recording. So this is going to, at this point, officially conclude episode two of the IPS Deep think tank series I do two of these a week at a minimum and these will be put through all the usual channels but this is number two i want to say thanks everyone here for uh, your comments and participation and for listening and there will be more to come and of course you'll get this in your archives and it'll be put out there on a premiere here soon as well Welcome to the IPS Deep Think Tank. 